Welcome back to series 23, everyone. This is the last episode of our Lancer series, and we are really excited to share it with you. First, as usual, announcements. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like a principal because I'm sitting in front of a microphone, too. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, did your school do that? Like, ours just had, like, a beep. <laughs> it didn't have the, like, the cool chimes. I honestly like, don't beep. remember. Oh. Then why did you make that this noise? TV tropes. Okay, you know what? Never mind. TV tropes. Back on track. <laughs> <laughs> the Descent into Midnight Kickstarter is launching February 15th, and we are so excited about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can hear more about the game on Series 18 of this very podcast. Mm -hmm. There are a ton of awesome people working on that project, including several folks who have been guests on this show. Um, I know Re, who was on our Magpies episode, is doing some of the accessibility help with mm -hmm. the project. Devin, who did um, our Edifice episodes with us, is doing some of the art. Um, I want to say that there are a couple other people, but I can't remember. You know, Tracy off the top Burnett's of my head. helping. Oh yes, Tracy's doing some of the Kickstarter coordination stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Tracy was on our Iron Edda episodes, so it's very exciting. Um, it's a game that Ryan and I both love so much, mm -hmm. so please keep an eye out for that. I'm sure we will be tweeting and talking about it for the duration of the Kickstarter, <laughs> so get used to it. We're not going to shut up about it. It's a very good game. It's really, really good. It's really good. It's so good, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one thing I wanted to highlight uh, was that fellow One Shot Network podcast, A Horror Borealis, and their parent podcast, The Cryptid Keeper, are doing a Patreon drive right now on The Cryptid Keeper Patreon. Uh, what's of interest to fans of that show is that at certain goals, uh, we'll actually be able to hear some bonus episodes uh, that take place in the world of A Horror Borealis. Uh, which I am thoroughly excited to hear. So uh, definitely check them out if you're interested as well. As always, we love getting reviews. They make us feel so good. Mm -hmm. You can leave them for us at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Podchaser, and we will read them on an episode like this one from Lieutenant from the United States on iTunes, titled, So Nice I Had to Review It Twice. <laughs> I reviewed the podcast much earlier in the year on another platform, and I'm confident in saying Amelia and Ryan have continued to make me love their show. Genuinely great people and hosts. They interest me in every system they use. Yes, Amelia, even Heroes Unlimited. <laughs> okay, I went back and listened to those episodes, by the way, and oh man, my exasperation is palpable. <laughs> it's, it's very choice. Uh, and are a constant source of inspiration in my own character creation. They've also introduced me to some amazing systems, including some that I normally would not have checked out, and have contributed to many a source book now in my library. Keep up the great work, you two. I look forward to what you create next. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Lieutenant. We appreciate it. And mm -hmm. I guess we'll allow this second review through <laughs> our review filter. No, I'm just kidding. We, we read every review. We do. We really do. Uh, I'm really glad that you have now also contributed to the role-playing game economy by mm -hmm. buying more books. Um, I like to pretend that it's a business expense. That's what I tell myself when I buy more role-playing game books that That's I know true. I won't have time to play. Um, it's a business expense. So just start I'm a sure podcast and buy the role-playing books and then write it off. Right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I think that's how it works. That's how that works, right? Look, it's how I justify it in my mind. I'm not committing any kind of tax fraud, but I tell myself it's for work. <laughs> well, with all of that out of the way, <laughs> let's get on with the episode, shall we? Enjoy. Welcome back to our discussion episode, everyone. Last time we created characters for Lancer. This episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Tom, one of the designers of Lancer. Unfortunately, Miguel was not able to join us for this episode, uh, but you can hear Miguel on the first episode of this series. Uh, Tom, do you want to go ahead and reintroduce yourself again uh, for everyone at home and tell us a bit about the character that you made in the last episode? Yeah, uh, I'm Tom Parkinson Morgan. I'm uh, the 
author and writer and artist of the uh, Image Comics series Kill Six Billion Demons, available in print and on the web, um, and uh, <laughs> also the co-writer of Monster. Um, and uh, the character I made is Lucius P. Abercrombie. Uh, his call sign is Keeps. His mech's name is Tangent Royal, and he drives around in a um, a rather old-fashioned GMS Everest. It has a big old heavy machine gun, a bunch of missile racks, and a whole lot of grenades strapped to it. It's probably extremely unsafe. <laughs> um, and uh, we've we've also discovered that he's got a a, a cigar box and a and a cigarette lighter in his in his mech cabin. Um, and uh, he's sort of the impromptu leader of this group uh, according to his talents <laughs> oh, self-identified self leader of the group leader, yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. i'm kind of pic i'm picturing him as sort of an older gentleman mm -hmm. probably probably likes to tell you about the old days a little too much back in my day <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ryan, do you want to tell us about your character? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my character's name is Liliana Quintel, and uh, her call sign is Rhapsody, and her uh, GMS Everest mech is uh, called Silent Crescendo, uh, which I absolutely love. It's very good. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> um, and uh, she used to be a medic before joining up to pilot the mechs, um, and... Uh, a little bit of the the medic uh, protecting people and saving people uh, kind of transfers over to her uh, mech piloting style of trying to get things done fast and protecting people by uh, just getting up close and, and personal with the, uh, the enemy uh, with uh, two... Uh, effectively laser swords. <laughs> three swords. Because, like, why yeah. not? Yes. Yeah, three swords. I've got yeah. three swords, yeah. So, yeah, it's... it's uh, yeah. Only two hands, but I got three swords. <laughs> um, and w one of the cool personalizations I have for the mech is when I am attacking with my swords, uh, my mech sings like in an like in otherworldly sort of... Uh, like, like the swords are singing. Amazing. Uh, how about yourself, Amelia? Um, I made a character. My pilot name is Monroe Parkhurst. Nice. Um, my call sign is Valhalla. And then uh, my mech name is Riskiest Assumption. Um, so my character <laughs> is <laughs> the outlaw background. Um, and then I decided that my mech is like it. It looks like a piece of junk. Um, it's not. It's in pretty good shape, but it, it looks like a piece of junk. It's covered in spikes. Um, and I, one of the triggers I took was show off. Um, so I just imagine oh, nice. that, like, I just like to go in and make a mess. And, like, the quickest way to do something is to just blow it up, probably. Mm hmm Very good. That's awesome. So... Uh, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment that we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? In this segment, we like to talk to our guests about their thoughts on character creation and how it relates to the system and other games. But first, we like to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, so we're going to ask the very cliche question. We're going to get it out of the way. <laughs> Can you tell us how you got into RPGs in the first place? And I want to ask the follow-up of oh. how you came into game design, too. We talked a little bit about it before. Oh, sure. But... Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, I have played RPGs for a long time. I actually started playing D&D um, &D, uh, back when 3rd Edition um, had, had recently come out. Um, and a bunch of kids at my school played it uh, and would, like, play it after class and stuff, like, like really surreptitiously, too, just, like, around the back of, like, wood shop, like, at the bleachers with dice and stuff, which is very weird. <laughs> and, of course, no, no, one knew, no one knows how to play D&D &D, um, when you first start playing and, you know, you're in middle mm -hmm. school. Yeah. Um, and uh, But I had a great time with it. I actually met a lot of people, a lot of my friends that way, and I actually met Miguel, my co-writer and uh, my friend of about 17 or so years now, um, playing D&D &D in the seventh grade, which is, which is great. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, and so I just kept playing playing a lot of RPGs, mostly uh, Dungeons and Dragons, um, 
and then the fourth edition D and D, and then fifth edition D and D, and that came out. Um, and then uh, I branched out along the way into like things like uh, Apocalypse World, and um, mm-hmm. I played a bit of Savage Worlds uh, with some friends, um, and I played some uh, and ran some Blades in the Dark, which is probably my favorite game, um, which I really enjoyed. And um, I've always liked game design. I used to um, design board games. Mm. Uh, it was like one of my hobbies in high school. Uh, I just like write write down board game design ideas and stuff because I quite like you know game systems and trying to figure out. I don't know like game game what makes games fun or interesting or like cool to play mm-hmm. for people because I, I enjoy games a lot, but I also like to be critical about them and think about like what is the what are the components of a game which make it interesting what makes the experience of playing a game a good experience um and think very carefully about that and how to sort of represent that in in um in a game so i started a lot with board games but then uh i i draw a comic book which is my main job nowadays and people would bug me about doing a rpg for the comic Hmm. so i was playing a lot of apocalypse world at the time and i was like well i'm gonna i should make a game based on apocalypse world because it's fairly easy to hack the game mm-hmm. um so I, I ended up doing a one for my comic uh which i released on patreon it was actually got very good reception i don't think it's a great pbta hack but <laughs> but it, i did finish it and it did get me kind of interested in game design and so uh i ended up uh writing monster with my uh longtime friend and then roommate uh miguel lopez and so we wrote together um and uh over a very long and uh public testing process we ended up with something resembling a good game so mm-hmm. <laughs> but it wasn't initially um <laughs> yeah but it, I, I learned a lot over the course of designing lots of action and of, of like writing it and thinking about like what works and doesn't work when it comes to to making games so i think i'm a much better designer now than when i when i started the process it was mm-hmm. definitely a long yeah. learning process but yeah that's Absolutely. sort of the long and the short of it it's kind of um to give you a good summary. Very cool. Uh, can you tell us uh, about your personal process for picking and creating characters in any role play system? Ooh, that's interesting. That's a good question too. I, I I'm actually curious. I, I'm, I don't like to always like to, um, I do this a lot. And sometimes when, I'm, when I come on podcast and I end up asking the host tons of questions and slowing the whole thing down, but how, <laughs> how about for you guys? Like, I'm, I don't know if you've touched on this before. Like what, what, are you guys very visual, or do you think about the idea first? Like, what what comes to you when you first think about it? I personally usually go off of like, what am I in the mood to play? Like, what kind mm. of person do I want to embody when I sit down to do this? Mm-hmm. I think I make them very differently depending on whether it's a one shot or a campaign. Oh yeah, if it's a campaign, I like I I get like real stressed out about it and i'm like <laughs> these decisions are forever yeah yeah um whereas if it's a one shot it's like Meh. and honestly on this show because we never have to play these characters mm-hmm. i will make all of the terrible decisions yep. good, good. Um, i'm a lot more careful in campaigns but generally yeah i kind of think about like personality and um and their goals because i'm much more of a narrative player sure yeah um so then i kind of like pick skills that kind of fit that personality okay mm-hmm yeah, and for myself, I like to do the, uh, I guess, the goody-goody type characters. Always, um, always. <laughs> but uh, I, I've grown a lot. Now they're now they're goody-goody, but a little bit naughty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, except that one time that I created uh, the most horrible person. <laughs> yeah, which I'm still really proud of you for. You followed through. Nice. He 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 broke me. Uh, yeah, since then you've been a lot better about it. Because early on in our episodes, I like to give Ryan crap. Early on in our episodes, he was really bad about that. Like every character he made was like just the nicest. My yeah. Um, whereas I I love interparty conflict, mm-hmm. and so like all of my characters are like kind of backstabby. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ryan is not about that, and so <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun to see him try and make uh, oh, nice. try and make a, a little bit naughty. Yeah, uh, I do I do regardless of. What I do, I like to create a character that's that's kind of uh, could be a hero, effectively. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. So f- I guess for my own answer, I um, I tend to think of like concept first, like and then see how that fits. Like in my mm-hmm. Savage Worlds game, I played in it was a superhero game using the superhero rules for that thing. So I was like, oh, okay. So what you know, I like to learn the parameters, and I think about like, oh, what what, what kind of what's the thing I want to do in that? So 
and I always try to pick characters that have something interesting going on or some kind of motivation and then kind of builds that. So like in that game I was playing in, uh, it was a superhero game and I'm like, what do I find really interesting as far as like superpowers? And I was like, well, I think like um, cloning or like duplication is like really interesting. So I looked and mm-hmm. I made a character who was a duplicator who could make copies of himself. Mm. But but the catch to his character was that he was pretty sure that he was just a copy that had been copied and, oh, no. and the original had died a long time ago. Oh, no. so he, and so he oh. was like having a constant existential crisis. <laughs> and, I love it. And like one of the, one of the quirks that he had with his uh, superpowers, which is actually part of the game mechanics, was that um, he shared sensation with all of his clones um, and could like communicate with them, but also could like look through their eyes and feel what they're feeling and stuff. It had a little bit of a hive mind thing, but not really a hive yeah. mind, all se- separate people, but like he could feel what they're feeling. And of course, they were really expendable because they're clones. And so, you know, we'd constantly be getting into these fights and he would it'd be like a giant robot and he'd be like, he'd be like, go, do, you know, deal with that. And the clone would go out and get like crushed and die. <laughs> and, and later on, someone came up to him and was like, was like, what happens to your clones when they die? He's like, oh no, they die. And I feel it. <laughs> and, you know, and like, it's like someone who's like coping with that. Oh no. So I, I've experienced my own mortality many times. Uh-huh. Right. So I, I always like to make characters that have something, something they're grappling with or some kind of internal thing that's like, driving them and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't I, I tend to find that in games that are very character focused or um a little more narrative it works better in some games like D, it doesn't always work because D doesn't have really have room for that unless you make room for it it's very much about like running around yeah, the game itself doesn't it, do that it, like you can certainly bring it yourself right. but it's it's not a feature of the game no so like I made a character in my uh, D&D game that someone's running right now, and I'm, I'm a player in, and I made a character who was very, like, morally minded. They were a paladin, um, and was like, no, we can't just kidnap this person. No, we can't just do this. And, of course, D&D 5e being, <laughs> D&D 5e and p- players being players, like, the party was doing all kinds of crazy, insane stuff all the time that my character had no approval for in the slightest, which totally, you know, slowed the game down, and I was like, I was constantly being the person who was like, we can't do this, which is, which is interesting if other players are willing to buy into that and have a conversation about it, but the players at my table weren't really interested in playing, or they didn't have as strong of like a role-playing concept as me. Yeah. Sure. So I was constantly being the person that had a character that had like principles uh, to a degree. There's and, no room for that and here. For that in D&D. <laughs> So then I made a lizard man who's really hungry all the time. That's his deal. And, that's, and there you go. That, mo- that works much better um, that's awesome. for that sort of game. So yeah, that's, I guess that's my answer. <laughs> I want to know how you think character creation in this game stacks up against other games. I wish it was, um, I wish it was a little more concise because I love really simple character creation. I like the way... Uh, I like the way Apocalypse World and those games handle it, where it's a sheet and you check boxes because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's so easy to onboard people. Uh, Lance, Lance is a little bit more finicky. I mean, innately it kind of has to be because mechs, mechs ha- kind of has to be a thing where the, your character has a pilot component and a mech component. Mm-hmm. And so it has to be a little more complicated. And there are a lot of choices to make in Lancer too. Um, so I wanted to very much limit the amount of choices you can take when you first get into the game and then gradually mm-hmm. introduce that. People often look at the game and they go, oh my god, it's like 440 pages of options. Well, it's not. It's like three pages of options at the first level and then yeah. it's like 120 pages at higher levels and the rest of it is other rules and stuff. But um, mm-hmm. So I think, it's, um, I think it's a fairly open system that I, I think manages to, to deal with the whole mech creation process fairly painlessly. I tried to get it there as, as much as possible. I think it's better than other like free form point by systems uh, that in my experience mm-hmm. make you do a bunch of math. Like I tried to make a mutants and masterminds character once for a game someone was going to run and it was a nightmare. It took me like three hours. I had to do math. I had to do oh, wow. calcu- calculators and oh, just like. Oh yeah, I don't do math. <sighs> God. Um, no. Yeah, but I. I, no, I have a liberal arts degree. I, yeah. I don't do math. <laughs> <laughs> Inevitably though, I, I, I think I'm, I'm pleased with how open it remains um, mm-hmm. and how you can kind of make a lot of character concepts very easily uh, in the system. So, I think for the amount that the book and you guys too talk about it being tactical, mm-hmm. um, I, I think that it isn't as crunchy as I expected it to be. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and I was, I, I feel like this was a really good middle of the road kind of a thing. Um, cause it still was in a lot of ways kind of doing the check boxes and that kind of stuff of like, mm-hmm. okay, here's a list of weapons that you can have. Mm-hmm. Which one do you want? Mm-hmm. Um, it was just, I think that there were more check boxes, yeah. but it still felt like pretty, like I said, a lot less crunchy than I expected it to be given the genre and like, yeah. <laughs> no math, <laughs> very little math. Yeah, no. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, uh, no, I can add two to things. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah, the thing is, uh, I, I I've always tried to my my philosophy of design is actually to make decisions uh, discreet, communicated clearly what kind of decision you're making, right, and like what it is and what your choices are, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, limited in scope to some degree because people think they want choice, but they actually don't. What they want is limited choices, a set mm-hmm. of dis- discrete limited choices, and also impactful. Yeah. I think people want discrete, limited, impactful choices. Do you guys have you played D and D four E? Have you made characters in that game? No, uh, no that's the one of them that I I did end up skipping. Four E four E actually is uh, one of my favorite games, um, design wise, because it did a lot for the genre of, of role playing games. Um, today, I would look at it and criticize a lot of aspects about it, but one of the interesting things that it did was. Um, make the character choices you have into like these like powers that you could take and that it was very clear what decisions you were making. Um, but one of the things it didn't do correctly was that there was lots of stuff in a lot of 90s RPGs, which you, uh, I think you mentioned, mm-hmm. do this thing where they're like, there's so many character options which just boil down to like plus two to this or plus one yeah. to this or whatever. And it's so boring. Uh, Heroes Unlimited, Ryan. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? like, give me... Give me five less character options. Give me one character, one two character options, but each of them do something interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and I am asked to choose between the two of them. And that's a much more interesting decision. It's more fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so absolutely. That's, that's kind of my belief. And I think I think I've done it okay in lots of things. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I think we talked about that with when we did our spire and our heart episodes. Mm. With um, I think that was the thing that Grant talked about mm-hmm. um, was just having like fewer choices, but all of them be pretty evocative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like spire. Spire. I, I, actually, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I think is great, and, and it should be in more games. And the concept is the juice. The game should have the juice, you know. Yes. When, when, you, when you see when you see a character option, you should say, "Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm, I I want to learn more about that." Mm-hmm. Um, as opposed to just yeah, I don't remember like the exact wording of it, but I know it's one of their design philosophies. Is like it like good options that like you can't choose between. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is I I think really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's boring. It's boring to pick a plus one to something in this circumstance. It's more interesting to like pick an option which is like, you're really good with every sword, and you can cut someone's head off if you crit them. Whoa! What the hell? That's so great. Um, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. That stuff is that's that's interesting to me. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and I think that like you know you talk about not wanting so many skills. It's a thing that we've talked about on the show yeah, a number yeah, of yeah. times too. That I call like the analysis paralysis. Right. Is just like you look at this whole list and it's like I don't even know where to start. I give up. Well, it was very it was very important to me to have limited choices when you first start playing the game because there's so many character options Mm -hmm. but also something you'll notice i mean we'll probably talk about it with character advancement uh shortly but um it was very important to me that every single choice in the game was tied to flavor and was tied to a decision you could make by looking at something and getting a feel for it like there are four mech manufacturers in the game and if you look at them visually you can understand what they're about Mm-hmm. And innately, mm-hmm. without having to understand any of the mechanics. And it was very important to me that I actually had that component to the game. And we, Miguel and I wrote all this flavor and all this art and stuff into the game because then it made making a decision much easier. It really guides you to look at that and be like, ah, that thing is what I want to play. That guy, guy there, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think for new players, like anytime I sit down and look at a new system, I've gotten a lot better about it since doing this show because we have to look sure, at a lot sure, of new yeah. systems and I have to kind of absorb them quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but it would always take me a couple of sessions to really figure out like what I'm doing and what all of these mm-hmm. choices really mean. Mm-hmm. And so I think only having a couple choices when you first start um lowers that barrier to entry for people Mm -hmm. too it's not as overwhelming and it's easier to sit down and be like oh i can learn about three things and then i'll worry about the rest of it when it's time the thing i I don't like about a lot of games is they really heavily onboard stuff uh uh, when they bring people on 
Mm-hmm. Um, like D and D, for example, uh, current edition of D, I, I, I know we'll talk about it a lot. It is like the you know the biggest thing people play. It's, it's the gateway drug. But if you try to get people to play a D and D D and D with you, they'll sometimes they'll just bounce off because making a D and D character remains a tremendous pain. Yeah. Because there's all kinds of weird antiquated stuff in the character creation. You have to ask people to make all kinds of weird decisions, mm-hmm. like innately, that the end up being. And especially if you haven't played the game before, mm-hmm. you don't understand what that choice. is is mm-hmm. about like what does this do yeah. later on yeah so you know in lancer i've tried to defray that somewhat by there being a step-by-step process of what do you think a character is good at mm-hmm. here's here's you know one two three choices but also um i wish i was better at it and i wish i could do something like you know like yeah like spire or, or a pbta character where i just had to check boxes and everything was there for me mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> that's so that's so great that's really really good yeah, uh, one thing I really liked about uh, the character creation in this system was um, picking all the pieces for the mech and even the the character's equipment and whatnot felt very much like those old um, like mech warrior games and armored core games. Oh, sure, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and those are the the big things that I had experience with growing up uh, that made me absolutely love the mech genre. Right. So it wasn't so much watching anime that had mechs in it or cartoons or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was these uh, games where you had all of these customizable options and stuff. And then seeing at level zero, like the the array of options that you have, nothing mm-hmm. like too overwhelming, mm-hmm. was pretty fantastic. The the. You know, the thing in the game, too, is, like, you're building a character, and it's not like you're buying equipment. Like, that is your character. Yeah. And you can swap it out, um, you know, every every mission you go on. You can mm-hmm. pick, pick different weapons and stuff, but, like, that that's who your character is. Um, and there's a great a great amount of freedom in Lancer to, like, build a character the way you want to build him. And that was very important to me. Um, and very hard to balance. Yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend it very important. But... <laughs> awesome. So, um... There's not too many, like, quote-unquote different types of characters mm-hmm. uh, in this game, but uh, how did how did you come to the decision to do kind of this more open-ended sort of character creation instead of, like, y- you are the tank, you're the heavy hitter, and so on? Uh, I, I just like, I like uh, character systems that um, you can make interesting character builds in. I'm a big fan of that stuff. So I wanted to make a game that handled, you know, your ability to like think creatively within a system to make a character that did a particular thing. But you also have the freedom to make decisions and do stuff that was like, this is cool for me. Um, I like a game called Shadow of the Demon Lord. Have you? Mm-hmm. I've heard uh, I've heard an AP about that. Um, and uh, I'm a huge fan of it. It's actually a big influence on Lancer. The accuracy difficulty system comes from uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord's Boon Bane system. Mm. And in that game... Uh, you very much like Warhammer RPG. You start at level zero, and then you go from level one to three. You pick a class, and I think you go from like or like one to four, four like five to eight, or something. so. You basically pick a class like every three levels uh, as you level up. You don't stay the same class for very long. Mm. It's very very discrete packages of of class. So I was like, well, what what if we do that? But you can just pick any class you like, and then you can pick it in any order and mix and match them. Because um, people kind of tend to do that anyway in character systems, right? They always tend to like, you know, if you look at a lot of people um, who are playing like optimized, I'm doing big quotes for the audio listeners, optimized <laughs> D&D characters, they always tend to be like multi-class characters. Mm-hmm. And the game is actually the current edition of Dungeons and Dragons does not handle multi-classing very well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not very balanced. Um, and a lot of games don't. A lot of games, people always look to, look to optimize their characters by taking several different character options, you know, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to build a game where like, you basically just pick the options that you want. Because that's how a mech game should be to me is you know, very much like that Armored Core thing of like picking the things that I find really cool mm-hmm. and using that to support a play style. And every mech in the game is doing a particular thing. And you'll read through the license and it's its, its own discrete package of like, I am a cool, agile melee fighter. Mm-hmm. And all three levels of my license do that. And I can take as many as one of those or as many as three of those if mm-hmm. I'm feeling like it. And 
that, that means you can, you know, if you want to be a cool, agile melee fighter, there are several flavors for you to pick from and mix mm -hmm. and match at your, at your discretion, basically. Um, so that was important to me. There still are, like, discrete sort of types of mechs. And if you're looking into people who have been playing this game for a long time, there tends to be certain types of, like, very optimized, you know, builds still. But you can play anything in this game from, like, I want to be a super tanky mech that sits there and has, like, a big rotary cannon. Or, um, I don't know, Amelia, you might like there's a mech that's in the... It's on our... Uh, it's not actually in the core book. It's on our uh, page. It's available for free. It's called the Zhang. And it's got a uh, huge fist. And it's so big, oh, you have to actually yes. spend a turn just charging it up, like Captain Falcon style, before you can play <laughs> nice. uh, So that, that's kind of the way we've differentiated characters in that game. It's like the choices. It, you know, it very much, it, I mean, it sounds a little cliche, but it's like the choices you make. It's the things you make during character creation. That becomes your character, essentially. Um, so what does the process of character creation tell us about the game of Lancer? Well, as you level up, you, you get license levels, mm -hmm. and that's actually uh, represented in the game by you getting another license or license level of, or level of access. Mm -hmm. And we choose to keep it very abstract. It's not actually like, a, I mean, it could be a literal license that you have, which I think it is by default, but it could also just represent like access to information, resources, you know, requisition, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to, it's just whatever you, you have available for your character, you always have access to it now, no matter what. Um, and and we don't have to worry about tracking currency or anything in the game, right? There's no currency in Lancer. There's no, like, money to track. You just get the yeah, stuff. Yeah, because that would be get. math. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, no math. So you just, have, you just have the stuff you have. Mm -hmm. And so each character level represents discrete stuff that you want to incorporate into your character. And then you get better at triggers, you get more grit, which increases your HP and attacks and a lot of stuff. Um, and then eventually you can start picking uh, uh, core bonuses, which is kind of a loyalty program thing. So there are four manufacturers. If you pick three in one manufacturer, you get a cool bonus you can pick. For the oh, cool. Um, but uh, I, 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 think it, I think it kind of tells you directly like, how your character is like moving through the universe and the kind of things they're picking up mm -hmm. um, and the things they're getting better at. Uh, so it's kind of cool. I like how it plays out. Yeah. Has a lot of good flavor uh, yeah. to what you can expect flavor wise with playing the game. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think so. I'm going to ask a really mean question mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me what's um, up. What do you think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation here? Oh, definitely uh, the the amount of decisions I'm asking you to make on character creation, I think it's still still a too high. Um, and I wish there was a way to streamline it. I haven't figured one out. I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, like I said, I, I really wish I could keep it a little simpler and, and make it more of a easy choice-by-choice choice thing. I mean, maybe if I had a choice, I would say, don't even get into your mech and level, you know, the first session, just do your pilot stuff, mm. then make a mech afterwards to kind of you know onboard people slowly because it can be overwhelming it's a new system it doesn't play exactly like any other system out there so there's lots of things that people kind of have hold like people always ask me where's the skill list and i'm like there's no skill list guys hold on <laughs> you know yeah i said that's a bit there's a lot there's a lot of like mental baggage that you have to mm -hmm. get over to play the game in the first place so i hate that i front load you know, it's one of the things i hate about rpgs like front loading all that yeah you know uh information on you so are there like templates in the book, like for like some of the, oh. you know, like the specifics of the mechs? I I, um, I intended. I to don't put, remember. I intended to put pre-made characters in there, but I I just didn't end up doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that would have been easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and I don't obviously, based on the podcast, um, like I don't necessarily like using like a pre-gen kind of a oh, character, sure, sure, but yeah. I know that like so like for the. Um, for the backgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, I had some of those like triggers kind of listed in like here's suggested right, things, right, right. and mm -hmm. so like I felt like that kind of it was like oh okay these are the things that go. With I maybe this. should have put some like example builds in there. I feel like I, I kind of actually skipped that over somewhere along the line. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I'm thinking through when yeah. when I was uh, going over the triggers, uh, they felt very much like uh, aspects in Fate. Oh sure, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, uh, I like that though about. Yeah, it had a very it had a very good feel to that. Um, mm -hmm. 
So the the like the lack of skills and stuff like that, uh, it it doesn't require as much uploading of information right up front because it's just like you get to interpret it. There is a very discreet separation between narrative play in Lancer and combat. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and also the ways you advance and the ways the capabilities your character has in both fields because I didn't want them to tie into each other. I want them to be separate because you want your character to be cool at narrative stuff and you also want them to be good at fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, because you do get out of your mech once in a while. Yeah, but you also you don't want the, the decisions you make about your narrative play to be weighted equally with the decisions you make about your fighting capability mm-hmm. because you're going to be expected to fight. That's part of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was very important to me to separate the two. So in a way that did actually kind of bloat the character creation a little bit. I tried separating it. I tried combining it at one point, but you ended up with weird things like that, like, you know, brash physical pilots always had really tough mechs for some reason, and you couldn't play mm. against type, you know, to some degree. And I didn't mm. like that at all. So we, were, we kind of have the system we have now. It makes sense. Yeah, I feel like I didn't mind it being two distinct things. I mm-hmm. felt like it was... Especially because there wasn't a whole lot of choices to make about the pilot. Yeah. Um, that it it was pretty quick. Yeah. And so yeah. it didn't feel It was, if too you can bloated. believe it, even more sparse in the past. And people actually asked for a little more fleshed out pilot stuff. Hmm. I could believe yeah. that. <laughs> I could I could see it. Is there something here that you're particularly proud of that you feel like you've done really well in this game? Uh, uh definitely uh balancing this game has been a nightmare. Because there's so many character <laughs> options, and people will find the craziest ways to to break your game, like completely unintended interactions and stuff, and you have to account for it. But it's been very rigorously playtested, and I can I can thoroughly say it is a very enjoyable tactics game with a lot of character options, and like the characters feel very powerful and impactful, and combat feels pretty dangerous, and uh, yeah. it's it's a lot of fun to play. So I'm very proud of that, definitely. Very cool. So. This is a genre that has a lot of history and a lot of media attached to it. Uh, yeah. Are are there parts of that that you specifically wanted to capture in this game or things that you specifically wanted to leave out? So, like, the funny thing is, like, I didn't really consume much mech media before writing Lancer. Um, I played the old uh, Mech Warrior on the Xbox mm-hmm. back in the day, uh, which was really fun. I played Armor Core, which I enjoyed a lot. Mm-hmm. Um I played a tiny amount of Titanfall, but like I think like um, like a demo of it back in the day. Mm. Um, and I really like Gurren Lagann, which is a mech anime. Mm. Uh, but that's about it. Like it's really literally all the mech sort of related media that I had uh, consumed prior to making the game. So for me, it was more about writing a cool like um, sci-fi game to a degree. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. I do like mech media, though, how it becomes the thing of, like, uh, it, it is a good me- a good medium for, like, RPG stories because by nature, the mech is, like, an oversized hero figure, mm. you know? It's like you're a god, kind of, and, you know, you have the power. It's literally power personified in a, in a thing, you know? It's like an mm. armor. Um, and I think, I think mech media is, is at its best when it's kind of either examining that in a critical way or interesting way or like evangelion for example or mm-hmm. um or when it's like really pl- playing into that um or or kind of uh you know kind of like enforcing that like hero fantasy to a degree mm-hmm. um a lot of mech media tends to be like like sort of war war media in general think about war like a lot of gundam mm-hmm. like good gundam thinks about that stuff so i uh I think it was important to represent that too. I think Miguel could probably talk more to that, um, him being the, the writer for the game and stuff, but I think it was important for him to think about how to contextualize the fact that mechs are like war machines, you know? Yeah. They're not, they're not for like, you know, peaceful conflict resolution. Yep. They are very much for fighting. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, how, how, do we, how do we think about, you know, the game is obviously about violence. And yeah. we don't want that to be unexamined to a degree. Um, and so the game has a lot of thoughts about, you know, what mechs should be doing and and uh, the violence your car- pilots are committing. And it kind of, you know, like I said, it makes you think about your cool robot and what you're actually doing with it. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> <quite a lot. laughs> mm-hmm. 
Okay, so this is this is my favorite part of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the fan fiction section, oh, nice. Excellent. where we get to talk about our our group and how we think how we think we would fare and how this game would go. Oh, excellent, excellent. I, I have some tables we could roll on if you'd like. Um, uh, we before. love random tables. Yes, okay, cool. please. I love it. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me have a look. See if I can find it for you all. Um, let's see. Where's our first one? Yeah, here you go. So if we go to page 40 of the core book, there's a little first session um, set of tables that you can roll on to figure out like who your characters are. Oh, what some fun. history yes. might be between them and stuff. I like so, that. So, do you want me to roll in the first one here? Let's figure out who our... Yeah, let's let's do it. Yes. All right, let's do this. Uh, so I got a nine, which means we are devotees of a higher power. Ooh. Hmm. All right. What kind of higher power do you think we serve? That's interesting. Oh, that is really interesting. Hmm. Yeah. All right, I got actually got a I got a follow up here. There's a next page. There's a patron table. Oh. So someone else should roll, and then we can find out what's in that one. Okay. You want to grab who's this our, one? Who's our patron? Yeah, where it's, um, D- what am I rolling D20? here? D20. One D20. D20. Okay. I got a nine. Our ancient martial code or law, our duty, is our patron. Oh, So maybe we're, we're sort of like space paladins. Okay. Or, or something well, like that. Well, there you go, Ryan. <laughs> yep, that, that fits very well with my character concept. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Which, which um, makes it really interesting that you're an outlaw. Yeah, that's true. Or you yeah. used to be an outlaw. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, maybe I'm just serving time. There you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's not entirely voluntary. <laughs> this is my community service. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's All right. Fun. And then if yeah. you want to do some uh, personal history, you yeah. can roll a d20 on the table and you can ask questions. So, for example, uh, I rolled an eight here, and my question is oh, this is interesting. Which of you taught me everything I know about building mechs? Ooh. Apparently, my character wasn't didn't build mechs before. And then you can answer and be like, like who, which one? Oh, I think it was me. Yeah, yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, I think mine is is largely built out of spare parts. Right. So right. Mm-hmm. there you go. So you taught my character how to actually put mechs together. Yeah, but now you think you're in charge. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like that. You guys should roll roll on that table too. Right. And see what you got. I will roll one. Here. All right. Um, I got fifteen. Uh, which of you is the most curious about me? Hmm. Huh. Good question. I think it's probably it's probably your character, Ryan. Because yeah, think, I feel like my character might know her a little better, or might know might know him a little better. Because is your character? Uh, 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 I did not pick. We'll say oh, okay. we'll say I'm um I am we'll use she her pronouns. Sure, yeah, yeah. So uh, Yeah, I would say my character is probably the most curious. More, more curious, yeah. Like mm-hmm. uh this outlaw is now in uh our organization, you know, fighting for this higher power right. uh for an ancient martial code or law. Mm-hmm. For mm-hmm. like a duty. I feel I feel like maybe like um maybe I, I, my my sort of headcanon here is that my character was in this in this organization, and was like, oh, I want to I want to learn how to build a mech. Then we have an outlaw like in the brig somewhere who knows how to build mechs. Yes. You know, <laughs> hey, if you come, I'll let you out if you teach me how to build a mech and you do a little time with us. You know, like maybe there's yeah. a deal we cut at some point. And that's, maybe that's your really character. I gotta get my hours in, and then I can yeah. then I'll be out of here. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Do you want to do you want to roll, Amelia? See what see what you got on the table. Oh, I think Ryan yep, has to go. My turn now. Oh, sorry, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. I rolled a one. Uh, Ooh. which of you did I grow up with? Well, it's probably my character. Huh? That makes a lot right. of sense, yeah. 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 Uh that's so so are we related? Or or is it question. more of a like maybe like a like a mentorship program? How or old something? is your character, do you think? I'm guessing quite young, like early twenties yeah. probably. Yeah, maybe maybe you grew up in this in this like martial order, this holy martial order we're in, as an yeah, acolyte. Early that on makes sense. Something. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, that's how we know each other. I like that. Yeah. I want to know what is this code we're fighting what for? What is this code we're fighting for? That's what I want to know. Do, is this like? Do we Bushido? even know? <laughs> yeah, do we even know? Yeah. That's a good question. That's ooh. But that that kind of makes it uh, more of an ominous uh, type thing instead of something hopeful and, and optimistic. 
Well, in well, you don't know. It might be. It might be very nice. Uh, Maybe we just want to save the elephants. <laughs> and... Are we a conservationist uh, <laughs> group? We we fight uh, against any and all mech poachers. Space poaching. Space poachers. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well. <laughs> but we also serve a higher power. Yeah. So I don't know. We um. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean a deity. That's very true, yeah. I mean, maybe that higher power is just the World Wildlife Fund. That's just true. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the future equivalent of it. Yeah, there you go. Conservationists. Yeah. An order of martial conservationists. Oh, no. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> With giant missiles and grenade launchers. You will save the pandas launchers. or else. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Does that make your character a poacher then, Amelia? I mean, probably. Oh, no. Yeah, Ooh. there you go. Oh, what a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like including random tables, uh, that yeah. kind of thing, because you can instantly, instantly make a little narrative up with just a few dice rolls, which is really fun. Yeah, yeah I like the idea that it's like, look, it's you or the pandas here. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like this uh, this random personal history table too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do that. It... You can um, you can do like missions. You can generate like environments and stuff too in the game. Mm-hmm. Got a few tables for yeah, that. Yeah, I like the missions. I was looking over some of those. Mm-hmm. Um, those are pretty cool. Okay, let's let's decide here. I'm gonna roll on this mission oh, table. Okay. We're gonna decide what we're nice. What we'd be doing. Um, Eleven. Attack hostile defensive position to destroy a key objective. Oh, okay. Wow. I mean, it's probably some kind of animal testing place. Right. That makes sense. There we go. <laughs> Or some kind of like, I don't know, oil pipeline. Do they still use oil? I in space? Know. In, lo- in Luxor? Uh, no, they don't use it. Don't it's probably it. like <laughs> helium or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. There is smuggling and, and uh, you know, outlaws and the fringe mm-hmm. areas of space, that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. It's probably like, like maybe some, some space mining. Yeah, maybe there's like a refinery that is like run by some, you know, nefarious PMC that is like polluting the environment. We have to destroy it for it. It makes all the space pandas go extinct. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I like this narrative. That's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. I like it. Yeah, that's... I... I, Gosh, I love random tables. Could run run the game (laughs) now really easily. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. But we don't do that here. No. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so I want to know, too, like, given, (laughs) given what we have for our characters here... Would we be any good at this? <laughs> I, I think we give it the best shot. Definitely. Uh, characters at level zero in Lancer, they're pretty capable, but they're not like, you know, superpowered gods. Yeah. You, yeah. You're, you're a rookie, you know? Yep. So we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if we have to destroy something, I'm all over it. Yeah, we'll probably it. be all right with that. We can probably do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, I think we can do that just fine. And, and I, I do have a, a high interest uh, in stealth, too. So oh, if, good. We, okay. if we needed a person to infiltrate stealthily, I could do oh, that. Oh, nice. Okay. And you have three swords. So. And I've, got, swords. I've actually yeah. got four, technically. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Because oh. I, I have a, I have a does personal your sword. Have a sword too? Yep. Yes, right. she does. That's what they call her: four swords. <laughs> but the mechs oh. only have three swords. That's right. When you yep. see the fourth one, it's too late. Yep. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, I love it. Perfect. All right. Well, nice. let's. Uh, Let's go ahead and get into our advancement discussion then. Oh, nice. Uh, in a segment that I love to call Take It Up a Level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So how do we think uh, characters uh, change as people within the narrative of the game? Um, you know, the thing is, the game doesn't concern itself overly much with the role-playing side of your character. Although it gives you lots of hooks to do so. Mm. Um, it doesn't actually mechanize any of that. Uh, in terms of the characters changing as people, they, they become more competent and have a lot more resources. And that's kind of a fun narrative, I suppose. Everyone becomes more like a veteran. You get more grit, you get more triggers, better triggers, and you have more access to, to mechs and you can build like more complicated and interesting mechs. So I think you do get that sense of like becoming a, an ace 
you know, mm-hmm. to a certain degree. And I think more individualized, too, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. as you add all of those things to your Mac yeah, and your character. Yeah, definitely. Um, the game does have a downtime system, and the downtime actions, some of them do actually build on each other, which is quite fun. So you can build some fun narratives out of just, like, continually going back into downtime. And figuring out like you can like start organizations or you can learn a skill or you can do stuff like that so that will that often creates a lot of cool character hooks for for building your character out but we don't have any like direct things that cope with like personal growth or anything in the game mm. and then how does leveling up work we've talked a little bit we've kind of just like hinted at it mm. a little bit but when you when you increase your license level and yep do all of that what mechanically happens and how does it how does it change things? So it's really simple. So when you level up a Lancer, you add plus two to any trigger, or you pick a, pick a, a new trigger at plus two. Um, you get one talent point to spend on any talent, and you get one license point to spend on any license you like in the entire book, which can get pretty daunting. Uh, but we'll do an experiment right now. Uh, I want you guys to... Um, go to the start of the compendium, which is on page 108. Or you can go to page uh, 123, actually. Tell me, tell me when you're there. Okay. Yeah, let me know in the, in the core book. You good? I'm there. Mm-hmm. Yeah? And all I want you to do is just flip through the book and just tell me what which mechs look really cool. <laughs> and just tell me what interests you about them. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> just flip through and just tell me what you think in, in the companion. You can go as fast or as slow as you like. Just stop when you hit something really cool. Actually, that's what we'll do. Is fi- find something cool and stop right there. Uh, metal mark? Striker. Yeah, metal mark. Yeah. So so when you level up, you, you pick a license. You pick the first level in any of these licenses, and it'll give you the two pieces of gear there. When you pick the second one, it'll give you the frame, so you can actually switch mechs from the Everest, and you can pick something else. Hmm. The metal mark is from Smith Germano Corpora, which is, as you can see, the the uh, corporation for people who like to drive sports cars that have swords. Oh yeah, um, and uh, they're focused on agility as a corporation and um, stealth, like hyper accurate weapons, big sniper rifles, hmm. that kind of thing. They're very fast, very evasive mechs. Uh, the metal mark, in particular if you'll read through the systems, can turn invisible, which is very powerful. So mm-hmm. it's sort of a stealth fighter mech. Um, and really this is cool. kind of what you do as you level up. You just like find the stuff that's cool, and you just you get levels in it, and then you can mix and match that stuff. So now, when you level up, you can take Metal Mark License Level 1, and you will be able to put uh, Flash Charges and the Reactive Weave on your Everest. Mm. So now you can play an Everest that has something that no one else can take because you've got that license level. So it starts to customize it further. If you take a second level in Metal Mark, you can now get in the Metal Mark. And you can also uh, put a rail rifle and a, and a, a shock knife on there. You know, oh, wow. so on and so forth. Um, or you can take the Everest and put the rail rifle on the Everest. Uh, so on and so forth. Interesting. Um, so it's just a process of like finding... It's stuff that's cool and and picking it and and kind of mixing and matching to make a really powerful mech. Yeah. What did you What did you find, Amelia? Did you find anything cool? Um. Well, I'm. St- there's a lot. In there. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a really spiky one on two two eleven. Oh yeah. The Manticore. Oh, the Manticore. Yeah. The ma- The Manticore is um, is from Horus. Horus is the hacking, uh, mech company that focuses on like mm. systems and e warfare. But uh, the nature of hacking in, in Lancer is a bit weird. And, and they, they have a lot of stuff that bends causality and time and other things in space. So you can, like, you can like hack someone's mech and make them teleport. Um, the Manticore in particular is kind of a uh, kamikaze mech. So it has lightning. Um, it has these huge lightning spines and it can shoot lightning out of it all the time. Um, and uh, it's when it when it uh, ever it's actually destroyed, it blows up in an enormous explosion. Um, wow. And you'll notice that all the flavor text in the Manticore systems uh, are quotes from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Uh, so it's sort of like playing a pal, a very angry paladin. Yeah, uh, playing in a Manticore. There's some really good things in here. 
that's great stuff yeah yeah or uh, i mean i pointed out the vlad before the vlad is a big spiky ips north star mech that you might enjoy amelia which is a kind of a tanky mech yeah i was looking at that one before yeah and it's got a nail gun and it can literally nail other mechs to the ground um yeah i want that yeah <laughs> so if you pick up the vlad when you level up to ll1 you will get the uh the impact lance and the web jaw snare. And the web jaw is like a big trap, like a bear trap, mech sized bear trap you, you throw out. Oh. And, oh, and the gosh, impact so lance good. is like, is literally a, a gun that's a melee weapon. It's like an energy lance that fires one shot off and it can penetrate through multiple mechs. Oh, um, wow. And so it's, it's basically, you know, it's based on poking things with, with very, very spiky melee weapons. <laughs> And then in yeah. LL2, you can climb in the Vlad, and then you can pilot that bad boy around and uh, make all your game masters very upset when they have lots of little enemies attack you. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so that's kind of how the game works. It's just it's just like finding cool... And of course, each one of these maxes has only three license levels, so inevitably you'll take more and more of them mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and mix and match them. You can get some truly ludicrous stuff in this game. You can really oh, go yeah. crazy. Um. There is... Yeah, I mean, and, and there's there's so much art in this book yes. that, like, it's really easy to, like, flip through mm -hmm. and be like, oh, I want that. I mean, because that's really what we did here is I was like, that one's spiky. Yeah. yeah. I want it. Yeah. Um, so, and so I think it's really easy to kind of pick even if you don't read through yeah. everything yeah. to look at it and be like, oh, this is the vibe that I want. Yeah, like, if you flip, flip to page, like, 247 for me real quick. You see that guy? That is... Uh, almost... <laughs> oh yes. yes that's the harrison armory showman so without me even telling you what what that guy's about what do you think that that guy's about what do you think his deal is uh looks like artillery yeah like heavy heavy ranged yeah he's just got a big he's got a big laser mm -hmm. his head is a laser oh wow <laughs> so that's the benefit of having a very art heavy book is people yeah. can just flip through and immediately be like yeah that guy looks like a gun platform that seems great yeah, I like that. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So so if you hit uh license level six, you could mm -hmm. theoretically have two full fully outfitted mechs to choose from. That's right. And, yeah. and mix and match. You can mix and match from so you could combine systems and stuff from any of those mechs together to wow. make tr truly what is like, you know, quote unquote your mech build. Yeah, or you could just slap a bunch of random stuff onto your your yeah. primary your your initial Mm -hmm. mech there are people who make some really fun builds i mean there's like there's like a mech called the lancaster which you can ride around like a horse Ooh. and people have made some great builds where uh, there's another mech called the goblin which can clamp onto another mech like a sort of symbiote and boost oh, wow. it and so you can have you can have a mech clamped onto a mech riding another mech <laughs> and i'm not sure how efficient it is but it is very fun that's amazing yeah <laughs> <laughs> And obviously, if you can do dumb stuff like that, why wouldn't you? Yeah, but the thing is, the game, it's not like it's a niche thing that, like, I would say, don't go into that because, you know, you're, you're, you're making a weak character. That's right. a pretty strong combination, and it works very well in the game. Yeah. And the game yeah. supports that um, and, uh, and encourages you to make crazy stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, for the, like, plethora of options that there are, it seems like it's... It doesn't like put you on a track the way a lot of other games do, where it's like, okay, I've picked this option, and it, like it, it doesn't feel like skill tree sort of right. thing, where it's like, if I want this, and then now I can't have that because it doesn't make sense. There is one thing in the game which is slightly limiting, which is the core bonus thing, which is every three levels you take with a certain company, you can take a bonus, but you need three levels from that company, so it's like a loyalty thing. So mm -hmm. if I had three levels in Smith Shimano Corpro, I could take a Smith Shimano Corpro core bonus. And if you have them slightly mismatched like that, you can't take exactly the ones you want. But there is a general massive system as one that everyone can take every three levels anyway, so you don't exactly miss out. Um, so there is some degree of like, if I if I am more loyal to this corporation, then I'll I'll get more, you know, mm -hmm. more benefits from that. That's awesome. Um, but that's only to encourage people to think about builds in in a particular way. Mm -hmm. I like how that has kind of like an in-universe connotation of. 
yeah. corporations know how to make their systems more compatible with right, themselves. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Well, and it's important to get all, you know, to fill out your punch card. Yes, yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. You got to get like that discount later on. Right, right. Every three stamps, you get a free Mac part. That's how it yep. works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. <laughs> that's how they get you. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, so that's how you level up in Monster. And and the thing is, you, you make very discreet decisions one decision at a time, so it's a lot easier when you level yeah. up. Pe- people that try making high-level characters in Monster, it's kind of a nightmare because you make, you're picking all these things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's actually a lot easier with ComCon, I will say. Try mm-hmm. try messing around with ComCon. You can make some really fun characters. Yeah, I, I use ComCon for the character creation in these episodes, and uh, it was surprisingly, once once I figured out where everything was, Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very, very easy to just hop into a thing and look at the mm-hmm. options and just pick what I needed to. Mm-hmm. And it even limited the options when I didn't have enough uh, points mm-hmm. or whatever. Eventually, that game will also have an encounter builder for the GM to track and keep all this stuff. And it will have live, live the ability to like take that onto your phone and, and just do it ah, live I, and all that stuff. I like so. that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that helps a lot. And it has Very an amazing nice. name generator. That's probably the most important yes, thing. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's honestly... The name generator... It's worth it just for yeah, that. Yeah, even if you don't use the names, it, it gives you the kind of the flavor of yeah, names in yeah. this world. Oh, yeah. And, mm-hmm. and you can easily come up with something based upon that, which I really yeah. like. Yeah. Actually, it was funny because we didn't have anything to do with the name generator. We never touched it, but the person who made it, uh, John Arena, who's a great developer, he, he just stuffed stuff a lot of stuff in there, and he hit the tone exactly. So yeah. you didn't have to tell him anything. He just, he, he pretty much nailed it from the get-go. So. That's awesome. That's so good. Mm-hmm. So I think the only thing we didn't exactly explicitly cover for advancement mm. was how do you gain a level? Oh, this is actually, uh, yeah. Um, so in Lancer, you, like I said, the game is structured around doing a mission, downtime, mission. Mm-hmm. Uh, at, you know, ad hoc. Oh, sorry, at L. You know, until you finish. And yep. uh, yeah, um, when you finish a mission in Lancer, you level up. Nice. Even if you're successful or you, or not successful, when the mission is over and completed and you return to your base or wherever you are, you still level up. Um, awesome. It was important to me that, you know, leveling up in Lancer is based on sessions played, basically, and mm-hmm. and running through missions and deciding... Because one of the things in Lancer asks, actually, one of the things the game actually asks you explicitly to do when you embark on a mission is think about the goal and the stakes involved. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it firmly and mechanically says, determine this before embarking on a mission. And mm-hmm. and so when those stakes or the goal have resolved or are no longer relevant, or something, something, something plays out, then you level up. So um, and I didn't want to tie it to success because, you know, if you fail and you've done this whole thing... You know, you don't get that to level mean up. You didn't learn anything, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's no XP tracking or anything. You just level up whenever you do a mission. Pretty yeah. simple. Twelve missions. That's it. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I I also like the uh, if you fail at the mission, you still level up, meaning you get access to better equipment and better like yeah yeah because uh, you can gear flavor that as like resources. You guys better we're gonna give you some more stuff, and you better succeed this time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> obviously we under-equipped you last time, so <laughs> right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. Very cool. Yeah. yeah, there's a reason there's a downtime action, which is which is called uh, buy some time, mm. and the only thing it does is forestall whatever inevitable doom is coming your way, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty good. That's amazing. I love that. Just hold. I'm just gonna put it off to later. It's fine. That's called procrastination. Yes, it's mechanized procrastination. Uh-huh. The there you go. Well, then this is the game for me. Perfect. <laughs> well, we did it. We made characters. We talked about them. This was good fun. I, was, I really yeah. enjoyed. Yeah, this. I like this game a lot. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. No, like I honestly, I. I think I told you in the emails that I've heard nothing but good things from my friends and like, yes, it lived up to my expectations. Oh, thank you very much. I I hope you'll check it out and get to maybe play a session or two. And at the very least, you should mess around with CompCon and make some characters because it's very fun. Um, Like Mm -hmm. I said, I don't have it installed on this computer, but like I've played around with it before and it's it's super fun. It's a good Mm -hmm. time. Yeah, I made it really, really easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And the game is out uh, in PDF form right now. In fact, we'll be releasing an update for it probably this weekend. Uh, that will be cool. the print print parody update 
um, and then we will we'll be printing copies for Kickstarter backers that will ship in March, and then you'll be able to probably purchase a physical copy via our website, which will definitely be up by then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but for now, you can find. I'm sure everyone can see the look on your face as you say that. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, we've we've been putting things off because we're focused on just getting the print copy out there. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. I know that like fulfillment on Kickstarters is like. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, it sounds. Mm-hmm. I just. I don't know. It gives me chest pain. We were very fortunate to to make enough money to be able to pay someone to do it for us. Because. Nice. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I would not want to sh- manually ship seven thousand books. No. That size. Oh my god. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Not four hundred some page. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. No. Where would you keep those? Yeah, I already have um <laughs> like six hundred comic books in my office right now that my wife oh, is no. telling me to get rid of. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you if you brought those home mm-hmm, too, mm-hmm. She'd probably she'd move out. Yeah, no, she would. Yeah, hundred like, percent. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Lancer. Can you remind everybody where they can find you and what sort of things you're working on? Yeah, um, you can find me at uh, uh, on Twitter at Orbital Dropkick. Um, you can find me at my webcomic. At, uh, kill six billion demons and also patreon.com slash kill six billion demons yeah there's there's like a i draw a whole comic that's actually my main gig and um you should read it if you like lance you should check it out uh, i hear it's pretty good there's, there's like <laughs> almost 500 pages of it up there and it's free so we'll, you know just go read it right. amazing there's also three print editions with image comics which you can buy in most comic shops go to your local comic shop that you can also find on amazon barnes and noble if you feel like it and then finally, um, you should check out uh, Miguel. Um, he's on Twitter at uh, the underscore one underscore Lopez. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can find us at Massive Press on Twitter and Massive Dash Press at itch.io is our main site. If you just Google Lancer or Mass- Massive and it's M A S S I F, you'll usually find us. Very cool. And we'll put links to all of it in the show oh, notes. Oh, and sweet. Yeah, Fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just go to the show notes. It'll all be there. Just, I, yeah. I, we should just say that every time. <laughs> yeah, right. People, like, list all of their stuff. And we're Perfect. like, yeah, it'll be in the show notes. Don't yeah. Worry. Uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, yeah, cheers. Yeah, thank you again so much for sitting down to do this with us. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. We will see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter, at CreationCast, or on our Discord server, at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter, at Ginger Reckoning, or on my other podcast, Garbage of the Five Rings. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Design Doc. Join hosts Hannah Schaefer and Evan Rowland as they redesign a role-playing game. Design Doc is an experiment in public participatory analog game design. It's fun, it's messy, and you're invited along for the ride. I did it. All right, we did it. I did it too.
Oh my god. I was there in spirit with all of you. <laughs> Thank you for thinking of us. <laughs> uh-huh. That's okay. I'm I'm trying to balance between uh being able to hear my washer and dryer in the background mm. and being able to hear myself. <laughs> that's okay. I think that's fine. I should be all right. I believe. <laughs> All right, I, I forget. I'm, I'm orange, right? Ryan. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> we just recorded like on Sunday, didn't we? Like a Yeah, but we use weird colors and I don't know. We just use a different shade of orange, Ryan. Oh, mm. It's more brown. Okay. Whatever you say, dear. <laughs> All right. Weird ass space. Oh, sorry. I can't, can I say the word ass? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> okay, so. Should we do the sign off then now and then hop back to uh, making people? Sure, we can do that. Okay. We'll just go down here and then you can move it around. Okay. Very cool. cool. All right. All right. Um, so now <laughs> we'll do editing magic. We can keep recording. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm back. Hey, hey. I am going to uh, see if I can not break my microphone positioning and put on my little foamy things. I don't know what to do. Black or blue? Ooh, blue. blue? That's a nice blue. Yeah, right. big fan. Let's see if it fits. Hey. <laughs> now it looks cool. Yeah, that works. Come on. Stop falling down. This thing is so precarious. Like, uh, the, I, I don't know how to tighten it anymore, but like it's tight just enough where if I don't touch it, it doesn't rotate forward. So I, I don't know. It, this was it. the the cheap Amazon like micro microphone arm. Yeah, and uh, it, it's done its job, is all I can say. Uh, but it's had the weight of a, a blue Yeti on it. Oh, nice. Just like a five pound mic. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I'm so, I, I will uh, send you guys probably the like jankiest character sheet possible. It's gonna be great. You, you should, uh... <laughs> uh, when we do this character creation, do do you want to go through using the core book? Is that would that be preferable to you? Uh yeah, the core book. Um, I think probably hmm, because I downloaded the CompCon thing, and since it's an official part of creating characters i don't see why we shouldn't use it yeah um but i have no idea where to start which is fine it's okay yeah (laughs) it it, it, it might be worthwhile um if if uh if we go through it using the book but then you can enter information into comp con i think that'll let you i think that's a good idea character sheets so yeah yeah and i'm just gonna I assume I'm I'm making a character with you guys, so I'm yes, doing, absolutely. Fun. I'm gonna do yeah. mine on on like a like lined paper, and it's gonna oh, be nice. super janky. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what we usually do is we'll we'll create a group of characters, uh, sans a GM, like we're all acting as the GM effectively. Oh, I see. There you go. And uh, then we we figure out why we're a group. Ah, well, uh, I've got some tables for us. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, li- I like it when the systems do our job for us. Oh yeah, it's really easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I th- our layout artist is Jay Isles, and she did a spectacular job. Very nice. Really, I, really great job. I've been uh, seeing a few games. Like a lot of Kickstarters have been, you know, a while ago that I supported, and then um, now now things are coming to fruition. And I'm seeing them, and I'm like, oh, I've got a lot of work to do on my game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, uh, the game did not look like this for a long time, so don't worry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was basically an yeah. a, a unformatted um, like Word document with like headings and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so people played it like that for a long time. So Yeah. You can actually find earlier versions of the game out there uh, on the web. You can probably search back as far as like 1.4 or something, which was like 10 versions ago. Oh, wow. Um, which is not a game I'd recommend playing, but it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And had uh, some different ideas. <laughs> my my uh, my game started in 
September of 2017, I believe. Oh, cool. Um, and the first version I got playable within a month. Oh, nice. And it, it was garbage. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> as it is, as it is. Uh-huh. Uh, I have a very good story for you guys, which is that I initially had like a, like a point buy system. And point buy was for everything in the game. And so you could build a mech that you could get rid of and you could get like things, you know, kind of a la, a la like uh, other point by games that like mm-hmm. you could strip out reactor shielding from your mech and you could like take its legs off and stuff. And so what people did is they did all these like downside things and then they didn't take any other systems and all they would do is cram as many guns into their mech as possible. <laughs> you, you, had, you had like the infamous ball of knives mech, which was just like 12 <laughs> knives coming out. It was just ridiculous. I had to wow. fix that pretty wow. early, but yeah, yeah. Very fun. That's awesome. I had to put my kids to bed because Eleanor had slipped a note under my door that said, is it bedtime yet? <laughs> wow, that's very like, responsible of her. That's a whole mood. But bedtime <laughs> isn't until 8. So it's only 7.45. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know. Get in your bed if you want to, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you do you, man. I don't very know. Very nice. oh, kids. <laughs> they apparently needed tea. What? Tea? This time yeah. of night. I d- my throat is dry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I need some tea. A <laughs> dash of honey, please. I mean, honestly. <laughs> if you're going to have a dry throat, might as well take care of it the proper way. <laughs> All right, and that's where I will... Uh, I'll make a little snap snaps so I know where I'm going to go. Uh, would, it doesn't like matter because s- I'm right at the end anyway. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to stop the audio on my side and then... Stop yeah, the let's, you let's do that. Let's go ahead okay. and stop and then uh, save this. And here we go. Okay.